Here's a photograph of uh, a famous person. It's Arthur C. Clarke. He was an author, he was an engineer, he was a futurist and a humanist. Uh, he proposed the concept behind geostationary satellites and was the author of the book, The Sentinel, that became the basis of the film in 2001, The Space Odyssey. And he made this interesting observation about humanity's place in the whole of the universe. He said two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe or we are not. And both are equally terrifying. You know, humanity has this great desire to discover intelligent life in the universe. Although, believe it or not, science actually has no formal definition of what intelligent life is. There is an organization called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, which makes this statement. From microbes to alien intelligence, the SETI Institute is America's only organization wholly dedicated to searching for life in the universe. Some of you may know of NASA's recent Perse Perseverance rover mission to Mars. It's just another example of humanity's interest in searching for life on another planet. So far, though, no extraterrestrial life, intelligent or otherwise, has actually been discovered, although millions of pounds and dollars are spent on this program each year. Now, the Bible shows and is a witness, I would suggest, that humanity is not alone. See, the Bible makes a few statements about God and the purpose of God himself. The Bible reveals to us that the Bible itself is the word of God. In these well-known words from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, we learn all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And the other point that I want to emphasize is that God creates and sustains all life. Job chapter 33, verse 4, the spirit or power of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. Sadly, the majority of people in the world choose to dismiss the book, the Bible, as a book of fiction and irrelevance. As this is a Bible talk, we will be exploring, Lord willing, its message in relation to God's love for humanity. So what more does the Bible have to say about this subject? Well, in Proverbs 15, verse 3, in poetic language, we're told that God is everywhere and sees both good and evil. I read it to you, Proverbs 15, verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And for those like the psalmist of old in the Old Testament, who believed in God and put their trust in him, he had something to say about uh, access to God and the greatest intelligence in the universe. It's there in Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Now, if we accept this premise that the Bible claims to be the word of God and that God exists and he's the creator of all things and that we therefore are not alone in the universe, I think it prompts a key question that the psalmist expresses so very well in Psalm 8 and verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest or in our modern language, cares for him. Simply restated, why would God be interested or care for humanity? Now, the answer I'm going to suggest is clearly to be found in the Bible, and it's all concerned with God's love for humanity, even though we are very insignificant in the vastness of the universe. More than this, the Bible reveals that God has a plan for those that love him. So let's explore further this subject. So we learn in the Bible that God is very involved and very aware of things in this world, even to the smallest level of detail. And such detail is, I think, well illustrated by the words of Jesus found in Luke chapter 12, verses six and seven. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, 
Fear not, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. Let's just explore this one facet of this concern and intimate detail that God has in his involvement with this world. Let's just take a typical human head. Here's Boris Johnson, got a great head of hair. A uh, typical human head has around 150,000 hairs on it. Actually, women have a few more hairs than men, but let's just go with 150,000. Now, there are about 8 billion people in the world. And that means that uh, if you count that, do the calculation, then you've got 120 followed by 15 zeros of hairs in the world on people's heads. And so, you know, very in this figure that the Lord Jesus Christ presents to us in Luke 12, we can get a real sense of the attention of detail that God has for men and women. Even so, it's common for people to question God's love for humanity. Now, this is nothing new throughout history, although you rarely hear people make these comments that God doesn't care for people in the world when things are going well for them. You know, in, um, in Israel, when they were in captivity in Babylon many hundreds of years ago, that they made similar comments of criticism that God didn't care. It's there in Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 9. Then said he unto them, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, the Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. Now from the Bible, when you read it, you will learn that God is not indifferent to the things that humanity does, especially when men and women live lives of violence and wickedness in contradiction to God's laws. In such situation, the Bible describes the judgmental side of God. You see, God will judge wickedness, and it introduces us to an aspect of God's character that is often ignored by people in the world, and it's a character aspect that's inseparable from his love. And this other character aspect is his righteous judgment. I think it's perhaps best summed up in Romans 11, verse 22. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. You know, a consideration of the Bible shows that for all the comments people make about God never intervening in the affairs of men, we see that this is not the case. You see, here I've just listed six incidents that show God has intervened in the affairs of men and women. We've got creation, we've got the flood at the time of Noah, the confounding of the languages during the construction of the Tower of Babel, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the exodus from Israel, of Israel from Egypt into the, the promised land. And the sixth one here is God provides Jesus as a savior for humanity from sin and death. And perhaps the greatest intervention so far on this list is number six, God provides Jesus as a savior for humanity from sin and death. But I want us to consider that intervention now in a little bit more detail. Now we could analyze the Greek and the Hebrew words associated with love in the English translation of the Bible, but I would suggest that's perhaps best kept for a Bible class study. Instead, I think we can see that a simple consideration of the context of the English word love used in the Bible, then we can get a real sense of its definition. And here we look at what is often referred to as the most quoted verse in the whole of scripture. It concerns God's love in giving his only son so that a believing humanity should not die or perish, as the word is used here, but have everlasting life. It's John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what a wonderful prospect this verse holds out to all those that believe in the Son of God. Now, what type of love is this that God is showing towards humanity? Now, I want us to consider the first use of the word love in the Bible. And it's very useful often to look at the first use of a word to get its definition. The first time love occurs is in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2. And I'll read it to you. And these are words uh, 
of instruction to Abraham. And he, God, said, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. And in Genesis 22, verse 2, that word lovest is the first time the word love occurs in Scripture. And then the verse continues, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, the type of love that we can see here being expressed in this verse 2 of Genesis 22 is the love of a father to a child. Notice it's also a love associated in the context of Abraham with faithfulness and selflessness on his part. If you see the development of this word love in the Bible, this same word is associated later on with God's love for the whole nation of Israel. You know, I had a boss who would frequently say to me at the end of a presentation or a report I gave him, Ian, you've not answered the so what question. In other words, I had not covered the implications to the business of my analysis. Now, similarly, we've just considered God's love for humanity very briefly, particularly in the giving of Jesus. What then are the implications for us and humanity as a whole? Well, we'll just touch upon one aspect of this that we looked at in our Bible reading in 1 John 4 verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And just to pick up on these ideas, we go to another part of scripture, Matthew chapter 5 verse 44, and I'll read it to you. But I, Jesus, say unto you, love your enemies. Now, why would we do this? To love your enemies, it goes totally against our very human nature. But you see, Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, in the next verse, provides the answer to why we should love our enemies. And it teaches us some more about God's love for humanity, which true disciples of Jesus are to show in their dealings with others. What does it say? Matthew 5, verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven, for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. See, this is the implication of God's love to humanity. We need to show the same love to others that God has shown to us. Notice that phrase, that you may be the children of your father. It is the love of a parent to their child or children, as we discovered earlier from our consideration of Genesis 22. And verse two. I want us to go now to Romans chapter eight to set the context. Please turn with me to Romans chapter eight and verses 31 and 32. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things. And so here's the context to some more verses we're going to look at in a few moments. The context is God's care of people. God's love and care for people is the context of these words. And then we go on to Romans chapter 8, verse 35, where the question is asked, who can separate us from the love of Christ? It's Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Now, seven things you will note are listed here. Seven in scripture is associated in the Bible with completeness. So these seven things I'm going to suggest to you represent a comprehensive list of all those things that might come about in our lives that might separate us from the love of Christ. Now, further on, in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, another question is asked, really, what shall be able to separate us on this occasion from the love of God? Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, 
nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. So here we see this time 10 things are listed and 10 is associated in the Bible with God's law and responsibility. And so I think there's an indication here, too, that God's law and our responsibility in keeping God's law is associated with those people that are going to be associated with God's love. And so these things um, are very important to reflect upon because they teach us a couple of things. Firstly, from the context, these aren't questions of doubt. They are rhetorical questions of confidence on the part of Paul when he wrote these words. He is absolutely convinced that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ or the love of God. But the thing to note, secondly, in this is that it doesn't say we'll never suffer in this life from these very things that are listed here. And so this is something to take note of. We never can live lives completely free from problems and difficulties, and yet God's love will always prevail. And in the ultimate, when God sent his son back to establish the kingdom of God upon this earth, then God's love will be revealed to all men. I just want to conclude now as we finish our subject with some words from Romans 8, verse 39. It's our final thought. Everything the world can throw at us will not, if we're faithful to God, be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you.